Well, thank you everyone for joining us today, both uh, here in person and virtually over the internet. Uh, today, I'm just going to be discussing uh, Mark Bassnight, Senator Mark Bassnight, and his career in North Carolina politics and his impact here on Northeast North Carolina. Uh, some of you may have joined us back in April uh, when we did a earlier version of this presentation. Uh, for those of you, of you who came back to hear me again, I, I deeply and sincerely appreciate that. Uh, for those of you joining for the first time, welcome. Thank you. So last time we covered a lot of background material on Senator Bassett, and we concluded just about the time where he became president pro temp. So today I'd like to flip that, briefly go the in the background, and then go more deeply into how he became president pro temp, and then how he leveraged that position for the betterment of Northeast North Carolina. So to begin with, as we started out last time, Mark Bass Knight hails from Manny on Roanoke Island in Dare County, North Carolina. Senator Bass Knight grew up in Manio around mid-century after World War II, and his upbringing was very reflective of that date and time. Uh, Manio in the mid-1950s was a very small community, pretty isolated from the rest of the state of North Carolina. Uh, it was not the tourist uh, destination that oh, it wow, is yeah. today. And so Mark Bassnight's upbringing is, is reflective of that in the sense that he's very um, tied to family, very impacted by his parents and their interests and his grandparents. And he's also deeply um, intertwined with the natural, ecological, and environmental spaces um, from the time growing up on the Outer Banks in an era that fishing um, and, and seagoing was uh, more pristine and more bountiful than it became over the course of his career. And so from that yeah, era, uh, Senator Bass Knight took away a love of his region, uh, the importance of history, and also um, got involved from his father in the construction trades. And so as Dare County developed, he became exposed to some of the issues that would arise later in 20th century North Carolina. And so, one other aspect of influence on Mark Bassnight was his grandfather, who was a local politician. And so his grandfather introduced Mark to politics at a very young age. Uh, like many Americans of his generation, Senator Bassnight was captivated by the 1960 presidential election with John F. Kennedy and even participated uh, in a degree of going out with his grandfather driving around the small town of Manio, perhaps even driving himself, allegedly, and holding up uh, signs along the lines of move over Mamie, the Kennedys are coming. But as the 1960s progressed, oops, slipped a little further there. As the 1960s progressed, um, Senator Bass Knight, or the future Senator Bass Knight, I should say, became more and more involved in, in state level North Carolina politics and more so the local intersection of state politics. At the time, campaigns were much more um, smaller than they are today. And so instead of focusing on TV ads, direct mass mailers, uh, campaigns really had a lot of attention placed on uh, community outreach efforts going to festivals, going to communities, organizing county by county uh, sub campaigns, if you will, for the overall candidate. And Senator Bass Knight uh, participated in that pretty frequently starting uh, late in his high school years and continuing on as a, as a young adult. Uh, in 1964 and 1968, he steadily progressed as a local campaign uh, official and 
ultimately culminating as the Dare County chairman uh, for one of the candidates in the 1968 Democratic primary for governor of North Carolina. So that was sort of Senator Bassett's introduction to politics in the state. But as he grew older uh, and, and entered uh, professional life as a co-owner of a small town construction company, laying the foundations, the sidewalks uh, of the cottages of the Outer Banks, uh, um, eventually some of the uh, growing local government construction space um, facilities, uh, such as new schools and, and, and new buildings. Um, he also had more and more involvement and more responsibility uh, in, in Dare County civic life. And so he began to be viewed as one of those emerging young leaders within a community. But even that still didn't grow him into a figure of prominence in the statewide sphere. For that, it was dependent upon uh, really the 1976 election, Jim Hunt and Mark Bassnight's affiliation with his cousin, Melvin Daniels, who as an aside, is it was one of the earliest benefactors of this institution, and uh, in fact has a room upstairs named after him as a uh, tribute to the great work that Melvin Daniels did uh, for the museum over the course of his entire life, both as a public official in the state senate in the 1970s, um, carrying enabling legislation for uh, the establishment of, of predecessor for the museum, of, and as well as a, a key contributor over the rest of his lifespan. Now, Melvin Daniels was in the state Senate when Jim Hunt was Lieutenant Governor. And so Melvin Daniels was a key early ally of then Lieutenant Governor Hunt and eventually Governor Hunt. And so when you're a, a key um, figure in a statewide campaign, one of the advantages you have, particularly in the 1970s, is the power of patronage. And so at the time, governors in the state had uh, a considerable level of appointment power. And if you were a regional power broker like Melvin Daniels was, you had the ability to um, reap the rewards of that. One of the most important positions in the entire state of North Carolina was the board of the Department of Transportation. Now this still exists in a much more neutered form. Uh, it does not have the leverage that it did in the 1970s. There's been a lot of reforms over the decades. But in the 1970s, the board of the DOT was, along with the UNC Board of Governors, uh, the two preeminent uh, appointment positions throughout the state of North Carolina. And Melvin Daniels recommended that Mark Bass Knight get one of the seats for District 1. Through that participation, Mark da uh, Melvin Daniels allowed Mark Bass Knight to get that kind of statewide exposure. To be at the center of power in Raleigh in making and fighting for uh, the allocation of highway dollars. And as a result, Mark Bass Knight took that opportunity and he ran. He, on the board, he fought for projects in the region for the big projects that had been neglected for a generation. And um, as a result, pushed forward a number of the important highways and important connectors that we have uh, and still use today, whether it be 17, whether it be NC 12 South, to Hatteras Island and to the ferry uh, terminal at the end of the island. Uh, so much so that even, and this is something that most um, people didn't realize, is that Mark Bassanet actually had NC-12 South named after him at the end of his tenure on the DOT board. Uh, nobody ever called Highway, mind you. And when he, 
uh, unlike the, the new bridge. <laughs> I'm mean, too far out of the area. Who knows? But um, that being said, it still was a recognition of the impact that he had at the time. So in 1984, Mark Bassley transitioned to the state Senate. And that was, again, Melvin Daniels was a key player in this as uh, then Senator Daniels opted to not stand for reelection at a meeting at Tuck's Barbecue um, over on 17 here in Elizabeth City. And he recommended his young cousin, Mark, for the seat. And this was a complete surprise to Mark Bassner. He had no intention of running for the North Carolina State Senate. When he went home from the DOT board in 1983, he thought that his career maybe wasn't finished forever, but uh, he, he certainly wasn't anticipating being back in Raleigh so soon as 1985. Uh, yet when the recommendation was made, uh, Mark couldn't say no. He, there was, he was, uh, he pondered his options, went home for a weekend after the barbecue, and had a number of supporters encourage him to run, and so much so that they, he, a pool of supporters offered to pay $1 a piece and put it together and, and, and submit the filing fee on his behalf. Now, he rejected that effort, but it was a testament to the um, support, reputation, and influence that he had maintained and um, cultivated and developed throughout the region during his service on the DOT board. In 1984, this area was still heavily democratic. Uh, and so even though the trends that if you step back and look at it from the vantage point of 2020 look pretty obvious, were not so concrete at the and set in stone at the time. Uh, counties in Northeast North Carolina were only just beginning to vote for Republicans at the federal level. Um, this happened for uh, Richard Nixon, Jesse Helms, and then ultimately in 1984 for Ronald Reagan and Jim Martin, uh, as well as Helms again. But those were only few and far between. Dare, Curry Tuck, the rest of the region was, was still solidly Democratic. And so Mark Bass Knight wins two thirds of the vote in 1984 in his first election, even as those Republican candidates at the federal and state level are gaining a meaningful vote share throughout Northeast North Carolina. So, in, so this brings us uh, as almost to a point where I really wanted to take today. Um, so, but we'll jump back to this in one second. Just the, the other, a uh, portion that we did delve through last time was Mark Bassett's continuing influence in highway transportation politics and funding in the state of North Carolina. Uh, this was a, a huge issue in the late, in the mid to late 1980s. It was an emphasis uh, for, um, for Governor Martin elected in 1984. It was an influence. It was a, a key issue for rural Democrats who controlled the General Assembly. In, in the mid to late 1980s. But they had a conflict over who to focus on and what revenue sources to use. Uh, governor Martin was our first real urban governor. His political career uh, hailed from uh, Mec Northern Mecklenburg County. And so he was um, very interested in the gridlock and the congestion that make up in urban areas traffic problems. Rural Democrats were focused on a very separate issue. They were interested on highway expansion, on going from two lane roads to four lane roads throughout all of Eastern North Carolina, throughout Western North Carolina, places that were had their traffic um, snarled based on highway combine, on, on combine usages on the highways that had to go through every little small farm town that didn't have direct routes. And that when you went to Raleigh from Eastern North Carolina, you had to wake up very, very early in the morning, three in the morning, four in the morning and leave for a 10 or 11 AM meeting in Raleigh. It would take six, seven hours. Uh, it just was not a convenient trip. And it really perpetuated uh, the self feelings of isolation that came about from many of the people living in Northeastern North Carolina at the time. 
So there was a, a, a large dispute over highway transportation in the late eighties, working on his background on the DOT board and his strong desire and interest to bring transportation uh, improvements to this region. Mark Fastnight was a key uh, participant in both uh, the study commission that uh, recommended options for the General Assembly to enact, as well as a key floor leader. Uh, although floor leader is the wrong term because he didn't speak on the issue, but nevertheless, uh, he was a key uh, contributor to the deliberations of the Eastern delegation in determining whether they would support or oppose the final package. And ultimately, because of uh, advocacy from people like Senator Bass Knight, the uh, enabling legislation that adopted the North Carolina Highway Trust Fund and governed uh, North Carolina's transportation dollar allocations for the next generation, uh, it specifically expressly stated a number of the roads that were to be improved with the use of those dollars. And if you look up and down that list, you'll find many of the very important roadways and projects throughout Northeastern North Carolina, including uh, a, a parallel span bridge over the right, over uh, the, the Curry Tuck Sound, which is the Wright Brothers Bridge, over improvements to Highway 64, uh, continued improvements to 17, and a number of other very important priorities for uh, Eastern North Carolina. So that's kind of where we got to last time. So now I wanted to step back, go back to 1985, and discuss Mark Bass Knight's uh, rise to the position of President Pro Tem. So in 1993, in December of 1993, the North Carolina Senate Democratic Caucus gathered at a very unusual spot. They gathered in Dare County at the Sanderling Resort in a pretty typical December weather day, uh, winds off the sound, uh, pretty gusty, uh, certainly not your typical beach weather if you're wanting a, a vacation to the Outer Banks. Nevertheless, this, is, this was something that was, didn't just happen be, because the Senate caucus wanted to be vacation. Traditionally, after elections, the North Carolina Senate Democrats gathered in Pinehurst uh, to discuss their leadership positions, to make introductions of new members, and to do the business of the caucus that they would have preferred to stay away from the prying eyes of the media and others in Raleigh. But this time was different. This time was not in Pinehurst. It was in, it was in Dare County. And that was because of Mark Bassett. Mark Bassett was elected Senate President Pro Tem on his home territory, on his home turf in 1993. How did he get there? That was one of the questions that I always wondered and wanted to answer when I began this research. So let's delve into it. So in 1985, Mark Bassnight gets elected, gets sworn in as a senator in the North Carolina Senate. You can see right there on the bottom of the screen, picture of him from that time period. And so as a freshman Democrat, Mark Bassnight gets placed on the Appropriations Committee, which is a plum assignment. Any legislator want, should want to be on appropriations. But it wasn't as prestigious as it might sound because 60% of the entire Senate ended up on appropriations. So it wasn't because he was on a, just got placed on appropriations early that led him to his rise. No, Mark Bass Knight was influential in the late eighties and the early nineties, ultimately concluded in his election as president pro tem because he was very personable, because he knew how to operate people politics. Mark Bassnett was a young Democrat. And that's, that's an important point because in the late 1980s, even as North Carolina was a one party state, even as the North Carolina Senate in particular was a one party organization, it wasn't harmony among the members. 
Yes, they had an overwhelming command of the chamber, but there was an internal divide among Senate Democrats between generations. And this isn't a unique thing to North Carolina or, or to the North Carolina Senate of this period either. It is generally present in a lot of um, one party entities, but it was particularly important in the story of Mark Massey. On one hand, you had senators from the World War II and Korea generation. That was the defining moment in their, in their life. They had served in combat, come home to North Carolina, gone home to their hometowns, and worked in the traditional industries of North Carolina in the 20th century. They were people who were involved in, in textiles and furniture and agriculture and uh, other kind of related support industries. The best example of this, speaking from the perspective of the Albemarle, is Monk Harrington from Bertie County. Senator Harrington had been in the Senate since John Kennedy's election, since Terry Sanford's election in 1960. He was a uh, small town guy from Lewiston, Woodville. He operated a, essentially what it was a tractor supply company, supporting the primary industry of the Northeast region, agriculture. And so Senator Harrington and, and others like him had a perspective on how the Senate should operate. On the other hand, you had a group of young Democrats. These were people who were more educated in terms of formal education. Many of them had gone on and gotten advanced, uh, undergraduate degrees, advanced degrees. A lot of them were lawyers. Uh, a host of them were for, from more urban areas, whether it be the bigger cities like Charlotte or Raleigh, or even the kind of the mid-tier um, urban areas of North Carolina, being Asheville and the like. Even, even some of the smaller towns like Goldsboro. But they were also involved in the new industries of North Carolina, the industries of the second half of the 20th century. These are people who were involved in real estate. They're involved in uh, both selling it as well as developing, or Mark Bassnight's case, building it. They were people who were uh, attorneys from those cities. They were bankers. They were a whole host of professions that had a very different outlook and perspective on, on matters of state. And the biggest clash between the two was over the operations of the Senate, over transparency, over how you went about your business. For those veterans of the Senate, it was to the, it was, the Senate should operate how the Senate always had operated. You put your time in, you became a leader, and you made the decisions. For the new group of senators, they wanted to be part of the decision making. They didn't want to get bought off by some earmarks from the discretionary fund. They wanted to be in the room. They wanted the voices to be heard and they wanted their constituents values represented in the discussion. And so this debate is represented by Mark Bassnight as much as anybody else. In fact, Mark Bassnight once made it very clear where he stood on this issue. One of the old time senators was Kenneth Royal. Kenneth Royal was nicknamed the Bear. He was from Durham. He was the son of uh, the last United States Secretary of War. And he was the most influential money writer, budget figure in the state of North Carolina. He knew the figures and nobody else did. So if you wanted appropriations, you went through Kenneth Royal. Well, Kenneth Royal held a meeting one time and didn't invite any of the other members of appropriations, except for a select few. Now, as I mentioned, appropriations had 30 members, 60% of the entire body. Well, when Mark Bassnight heard that, well, he, boy, he got angry. 
And didn't matter that he was a, a, a young senator. Didn't matter that he was a one-term senator. Didn't matter that Kenneth Royal, everyone was afraid of Kenneth Royal. But Mark Bassnight wasn't. And so Mark Bassnight hounded down the, the, the holes of the legislature looking for Kenneth Royal. And when he found Kenneth Royal, he started tearing into Kenneth Royal. Nobody could believe this. It, it wasn't done. It was unprecedented. And, and, and they almost got in a fight, a fist fight on the, in the floor and the, uh, the, the whole of the Senate. So Mark Bassman wasn't going to take anything. He wasn't going to take the leadership telling him what to do. And, and so you could say, okay, now is somebody that brash, they're going to get punished. Well, that was actually the opposite of what happened. So Mark Bassnight standing up to Kenneth Royal, standing up to the old timers, actually won their influence, won the respect. And so what happens is most of the young senators chirp, complain to the media. They don't like what's happening. They try to overthrow uh, the Senate leaders. They try to out Monk Harrington as Senate president pro tem. But Mark Fastlane took a different approach. Now he was allied with those young senators. He voted the same way as the young senators, but he would get up in the morning and he'd go down to some of the Raleigh establishments, um, like Big Ed's, and he'd have breakfast with the old time veteran senators who were also up at five and six in the morning. Whereas most of the younger senators slept in, uh, worked, if they were nearby in the Raleigh area, uh, you know, did other aspects besides social life within the Senate membership. Now, can you say it was helped because Senator Bassan couldn't go home at night? Yeah, sure, it was, uh, it was too long of a drop. He had to stay in Raleigh. But his breakfast with the veterans, his maintaining good relationships with the veterans, building that base of trust was important because then he didn't get punished as those senators still held power for the last few years. But at the same time, it was clear where his allegiance was. It was clear where his loyalties lay. They, they were with Henson Barnes. Henson Barnes was a blueberry farmer from Wayne County, but he was the leader of the younger Senate Democrats. And for those of you here in Northeast North Carolina, you might recognize the last name because for many years we've had a Judge Barnes and that is Henson Barnes's nephew. So Henson Barnes finally gets elected to President Pro Tem in 1988. And by this point, Mark Bass Knight had slowly climbed up the ranks. He became the chair of the base budget committee, which gave him an unparalleled education into the affairs of the state of North Carolina. He was able to learn the budget and learn the operations of the state. And then when Henson Barnes took over as president pro tem, Henson Barnes outs Kenneth Royal and he replaces him with Mark Bass. And there in lies where Mark Bassnight's power comes from. He was able to straddle the divide, stay on good terms with both sides, build up his knowledge of the Senate. And then when the transition happened, was in place to ride that wave into the appropriations chairmanship. And from the appropriations chairmanship, Mark Bassnight was able to replaced Kenneth Royal as a person who knew all of the finances of the state. He was able to operate the appropriations chairmanship in a different manner that fulfilled the desires of the younger senators, even amidst the very challenging budget time. And there was a recession in 1991 and the state had to raise taxes and cut spending and was able to essentially circumvent some of the other younger leaders who are also interested in Senate leadership. And so by the time 
1992 rolled around. By the time Henson Barnes left to run for attorney general of the state, the op opening the opportunity was there for Mark Fastnight to become the preeminent candidate to become president in pro tem. His, his challengers saw their support go into Senator Fastnight or dwindling. And ultimately, one by one, and there was four people inclusive of Mark Fastnight who were initially interested in the post, but they whittled themselves down until it was just Mark Fastnight. And so that's how you get to Dare County in early 1990, in late 1992. That's how you get to the Sanderland, where Mark Fastnight is coronated as president pro tem of the North Carolina State Senate. And that's when the new era of North Carolina leadership takes over, an era that is supremely focused on bringing, bridging the disparity between the shining stars of the state, Raleigh, Charlotte, RTP, and the rest, places east of 95, the places west of 77. And that is the focus of the next two decades of Mark Fastlane's leadership. So in the 1993 session, which is the first Mark Fastnight led session, he did what he knew best, leverage the budget, use appropriations to secure needs, funding for needs in Northeast North Carolina. For most people, they like to trumpet key legislation, but that's not how Mark Bassline operated. It's generally not how Senate leaders operate, for that matter, but it was, certainly was not how Mark Bassett operated. He wasn't interested in floor speeches or signature pieces of legislation that you could wave about. Instead, Mark Bassett knew that if you really wanted to see things happen, you got to put it in the budget. And so, in 1993 session, the budget of 1993 is reflective of that. There's dollars. So things like what ultimately became the Bob Martin Agriculture Center in Williamson are included. There's millions of dollars for the school systems in this region. There is many times more pro dollars for projects than the region had seen prior. But there is also what we call special provisions, which is essentially legislation wrapped up into the budget. And so through that, you have items created like the Northeast Regional Commission and several other regional commissions as well. And these commissions are design, were designed, because they're no longer existing, but they were designed to decentralize the recruiting efforts for commerce and industry and trade in the state of North Carolina. So rather than having just the Department of Commerce in Raleigh go out and secure business, which was anticipated to be once again a boon for the shining stars because those are the things that are easiest to sell, easiest to leverage, our education system and other assets. The regional commissions were designed to do the same activities, but with a local lens in mind. They would know their areas. They would know what, what industries were strong in each respective region. They would go out and secure industries that would be beneficial and would find uh, where they were located to be advantageous. The Northeast North Regional Commission was located in Edenton and for the better part of 20 years fulfilled that mission as best as it can with the resources 